So good morning to, to you all, and thank you so much. We are talking about the overfishing, and I, I know that lots of people in the room knows what is overfishing, but uh, other people don't. That's why we are here to share uh, knowledge with everyone and to get to everyone. So what is, in, in a few words for you, the overfishing? How do you explain people? What is this? And what is this huge problem? So I'll start with you, Anna. Okay, Hi, cool. good morning. Hi, good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah, uh -huh. I think we can. Okay. So first of all, good morning, and thank you for this very kind invitation. It's a pleasure uh, for us, for Sienna, to be here. Uh, actually, if you, we want to explain what's overfishing to anyone in a manner in a manner that they can understand, it's excessive fishing. So it's basically when you when you take out of a fish population more fish than it can uh, replenish by itself. So I think that's a, fair, a fairly good explanation of what overfishing is. I think it's easy to understand. Um, Captain, uh, on March 24 of uh, 2021, you wrote a commentary named Sustainable Fisheries, a Contradiction. So could you expand on that? And, and is there no possibility for sustainable fishing today, nowadays? I know we heard you uh, before, but now you can explain uh, more specifically. Well, if you ask me if there's sustainable fishing, then I would say no, uh, there is not. We, the problem is we've been looking at the ocean for far too long as this unlimited source of protein that we can just fish out and it will replenish itself indefinitely. And we've been doing this for centuries. And what we're seeing is that not only plastic is a problem, but also the populations of fish around the world are completely crashing. There's very few left of what was there before. But the problem is we've only seen what we've seen in our lifetime. So we don't see how abundant the seas was 200 years ago. We only notice from stories that we've been hearing from people around the world. So we're only seeing what we have seen in the ocean. I've been sailing the oceans for 20 years myself. And I remember the first time across the Pacific, I expected there'd be whales and dolphins and the sea would be teeming with life. And when we crossed from the Galapagos to New Zealand, we saw not a single whale, not one. And back in the days, hundreds scary, of- scary, no? It's very scary. And that's not just the whales that have disappeared, but also the dolphins have disappeared and the sharks are disappearing. And it's still because people think that we can just take out of the sea and it'll be fine, it'll recover, it'll repopulate itself. And now there's the added problem of plastic in the ocean. So you know, we really need to address this issue urgently because it's becoming critical. And I think you know, we in, in Europe and the US, we have the choice to choose for alternatives. But there is communities in Africa or anywhere in the world that are really dependent on, on fisheries because that's what they, the only thing they have to feed their families. So what little is left, we should leave to these communities that are completely dependent on, uh, on fisheries and let us do something else. That would really help the issue of overfishing already. Because we are here, we are in Europe, uh, we have here people from uh, all over the world, but when we, 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 we need to think about the symmetries. So you, you focus a very important point. How do you say to these persons that because the problem is, what am I going to eat today? How am I going to survive? So we are in another level. So it's, it's difficult when we have a part of the world in one direction and the other part in an opposite direction or not in the same scale. How, how, how do you see this, Anna? Yeah, it's, uh, it's something that we, and I have to say that we at Siena and with several colleagues of our, from other NGOs, we work essentially on the European Union and now the UK also. Uh, but it's, it's, it's impossible not to recognize that there are huge asymmetries. What we do defend, at least here in Portugal, as if you don't know, we are the, I mean, the biggest fish, seafood in this case, consumers in the European Union, we consume uh, uh, three times more the, than the average of the European Union. So one thing that we do say, and trust me, this is not easy to say in Portugal, is that people probably should eat less fish if they can do that, uh, depending on their context, obviously, and, you know, of, of other, I don't know, th th there are so many things involved when you talk about eating less fish, or maybe not 
<laughs> no fish at all, but, but, but it's difficult and I think that it's something that we are starting to discuss here. Definitely that's, that's something that we have to discuss in Europe for sure, uh, but we have to acknowledge that there are other people in other sides of the world that cannot do that, simply cannot do that. And I'm not saying it's easy, it's very complex, so I think we should start where it's easier. This is low-hanging fruit for us. We can eat less fish, that's not a big deal. It's a matter of if we want to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, Ali, uh, um, we heard Hannah, it's one of your, it was one of your key messages in your documentary and the work you do uh, about the, the, the need that we, we, we have to stop eating fish or eat less fish. Uh, what can we, uh, um, can we as a, the average person, mm. all of us, can do to help? So after about four and a half years of producing Sea Spiracy and it having such a huge impact, we really identified three areas where we can have the most impact as people. Some relate to us as individuals, some relate to us um, in terms of how we can influence governments to take action. And it came down to this message of stop, defund, protect. Stop coming down to, like, we need to stop eating fish. It's, it's a wildlife product. We don't think of that when we consume fish. When we other animals, which I'm also not in, in agreement with, it's, it, at least as a farming process, you can replenish those populations. When we eat seafood, it's wildlife. So drawing back on that as much as we can, for some people it might be 100% overnight, for some people it might be a few times a week less, those are good moves in the right direction. We need to defund the fishing industry from a governmental level. So around $35 billion is being used by governments, taxpayer money, to prop up the fishing industry for, for bigger ships, for more fishing permits, to go out there for longer and catch more fish. It doesn't make any sense that we'd be doing this. We should be directing at least even a portion of that money to replenishing the ocean, to uh, enforcing what's coming next, which is we need to uh, protect. We need to create these highly effective marine protected areas, not just on paper, but something that actually means we need to protect the oceans from fishing. There's actually a number of marine protected areas that don't actually protect from fishing. They protect from jet skiing on the water or kayaking on the water. That doesn't make any sense. So we need to uh, also have these highly uh, effective marine protected areas with actual enforcement. Uh, um, Stephen, the ocean is a shared global resource. We all talk about it. Um, what is the best way today to ensure that the laws that are protecting our oceans are indeed applied, in, in your opinion? So I want to address some of the comments that the other panelists made before I get to that point. First, fishing is completely unprofitable as an industry without government support. It can't exist. All of us, I mean, since 2000, it's been government policy around the world to make agriculture, food production, cheap. They subsidize production. It used to be that they asked farmers not to plant things to keep the price high for farmers to make a decent living. Now they decide instead that it's a better anti-poverty measure to subsidize agriculture and fishing to make food prices cheap. Well, cheap food prices mean that we consume more. We consume a lot more. That's why we waste 20 to 30 percent of all the food that we actually produce. Because it's so cheap we don't care about wasting it. And that's a problem in the world. That's one. Two, seafood, we have a crisis in seafood today because we have seven and a half billion people on the planet. We, since World War II we've invented really great ways of industrial fishing, of taking fish out of the ocean. But think about it, fishing is the only agricultural food industry that isn't required to replenish its own stock. If you have a cattle farm, you replenish your stock when you slaughter cows. When you have a pig farm, you replenish your stock, you breed pigs to, to fishing, they're not required to breed fish, to cull fish from the ocean. So we have a finite supply and we're running out. Since World War II, 90% of all fish stocks are gone. 90%. What we have in the ocean today is 10% of what we had in 1945. We're probably the last generation that will eat live, uh, fresh caught fish. The last. Now, we in the room, you know, I take the point, yeah, we could stop eating fishing because we're the group of people that are already converted to the idea that we, are, we know this. But are we really going to get seven and a half billion people around the world to change their behavior and eat less fish? I don't think so. Sorry. The only solution we have, we have a supply and demand problem. We don't have enough fish. We have a lot of people. We can't get rid of the people. That's not palatable. So what are we going to do? We need more fish. We need more aquaculture. We need more lab-grown fish. 
and we need to restock our natural resources of fish. Around the world, we use hatcheries to stock streams for sports fishermen. Why aren't we creating hatcheries to restock the ocean? I know it sounds crazy, but it's what we do in the world to restock natural streams, rivers, and ponds. Why don't we restock the ocean? Because that's our ultimate problem. We have a lot of mouths to feed. We're not going to change human behavior. I personally think the only solution is we need more fish. And we can't deny it anymore because the, the facts that you present here is true. They are true, are facts. So what, what, what is failing? Uh, it's it's uh, awareness also, it's we, uh, education. We, what, what is, what is the, 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 main, the main problem, yeah. you know? We've had very, we've had, well, yeah, we've had monetary it's, it's, policy that's made things cheap for 10 years. That's ending, that party's over. Things are going to get expensive. That's one. Two, we humans, we tend to react when things get to a crisis level, and then we make our decisions to do things differently. And we're just about at the crisis. It's just that a lot of people in the world don't know it yet. It's up to us. It's up to movies like Ali made. It's up to the mass media. It's up to journalists. We have to tell the story that we're, that we're out of time. We need to change our behavior. But And the time was yesterday. Uh, uh, and. Uh, and what is the impact of the, the overfishing? We are talking mostly of the overfishing on local communities around the world. Because in Siena, you have many experiences and many examples you can give to us. Yeah, um, so there are obvious uh, impacts. I mean, you have loss of employment, obviously, because people that uh, do rely on that activity uh, have it less, I, I guess, if you have the, uh, the industrial fleet going there and fishing all the fish that you could fish for yourself and for your community and for your family, you have so lots of employment, obviously. You, have, you also have a problem of food security, again, obviously, so uh, you have a food crisis. Um, and I wish I could be as optimistic as Stephen, saying that we can grow fish in aquaculture. Not all fish can be grown in aquaculture. That there, there are some technical and mm -hmm. uh, logistical, I would say, uh, difficulties uh, that it's that makes it pretty much impossible for several species. So um, uh, yes, I think we have to rethink how we consume, not only fish, if I may, but we have to rethink how we consume. And probably since we were the ones causing this problem, I think it's only fair that we are also the ones taking the lead to solve it. And if we have to eat less fish, then be it. And I know this is sensible. I know that this is difficult, but um, as for your question again, Katarina, I think that also the obvious effects that ha happen from having a degrading ecosystem. If you live in a community that depends on tourism or that depends on, I don't know, any other kind of activity that doesn't really uh, consist on taking fish out of the ocean, you will have a problem because that has a downgrade, uh, like a cascading effect uh, on the food web and on uh, all of the ecosystems. So there are very obvious impacts. Some are more direct, some are more indirect. But ultimately, even if you don't eat fish, you don't live near the ocean, you don't care about the ocean, you will be impacted by the loss of the biodiversity and uh, fish in the ocean. So I think it impacts all of us. It's just a matter of scale. Uh, Holly, you, you, you felt this on your skin and it, it took a lot of courage to do what, what you did and we are going to talk about it later in the, the, the afternoon panel. But what do you say that we, f uh, would you say that we face a, a lack of oversight related to fishing industry today uh, with the f uh, fishing fleets being not or barely monitored? Like Absolutely. Yeah, this is one of those problems that is outside, out of mind. Everyone in the conservation space when it comes to the fishing industry says, says the same thing. It's the other side of the horizon. We don't see what's going on. It's impossible to really wrap your head around it. We have to rely on Sea Shepherd for a lot of footage because they're the only ones really out there who are actually witnessing it going on board these vessels. And um, it's, it's one of the, it's like the wild west. It's a, it's a frontier without any real regulation. And that's why it's becoming inextricably linked with the global crime uh, trade, with, with drugs trafficking and guns uh, trafficking. Uh, something like $80 billion worth of heroin and cocaine is moved around the world through these small fishing vessels who now aren't making any profit from the fishing industry. And so they're now, you know, you're having these big vessels coming into areas like West Africa, 
depleting all the fish, those local populations have no jobs left, and then they find themselves going into all kinds of avenues. And oftentimes they are paid in drugs, which then they sell to the local communities, which ravish those communities. Uh, you've seen this with the Somalia pirate issue. Somalian pirates used to be small-scale fishermen, and their fish was basically stolen from them. So it, it, it tumbles down. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I don't think it could, you know, I could, I could probably spend 20 years making Seaspiracy again and still won't get to the bottom of it. Um, I think, Alex, you've been doing this for 20 years, something like that? I have, yeah, 20. More than 20 years, I think. Uh, no, I've... It's He's working not at all. Hello? Yeah, okay. Yeah? okay. <laughs> it's working now. Uh, yeah, I've been with CJF for 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, just like to comment on getting fish for people. Um, I think the problem really is that we have a capacity problem. There is too many people living on the planet right now for us to still allow animal protein to be consumed in the massive numbers that we're consuming it. So we should really look at, I mean, you mentioned uh, lab-grown fish. That's a good development. There's lab-grown meat, lab-grown fish. There's a lot of, uh, I mean, I've been vegan for 20 years. When I see the development of veganism right now, the products that are out in the market, there is fake fish out there that taste exactly the same mm -hmm. as the real deal. So if we further develop these products, if we subsidize the development of these products so they can become available on massive scale, then yes, a lot of people are dependent on, uh, on fish for protein, then we give them that. It's the same thing, and I'm sure that the local fishermen in Liberia would rather just get these products and not have to go out in that dugout canoe to catch fish. So we can actually give them that. So we really should focus all our efforts into making um, plant-based alternatives available for people around the world. And, yeah. and, yes, and, all of the above. Uh, but a lot of the issues you talked about are solvable. Illegal fishing, I mean, let's be honest. We could get rid of illegal fishing in two years if we really wanted to. Look at the Western response to the Ukrainian war that we've done in Europe. Look how many arms we're sending to support the Ukrainians in the war against Russia. That took six months. What, we can't figure out how to get illegal fishing vessels? Most illegal fishing vessels trade in drugs and traveler's checks. They use traveler's checks as an illegal currency. I mean, all it would take is the redemption of those traveler's checks. The nullification of, all it would take is, one, is American Express getting rid of traveler's checks and illegal fishing would have to find another currency to trade. There are just so many ways we could get rid of that if we really wanted to. Are we talking about here about also major interests and lobbies in the industry, for instance, yes. and with governments. Because we have to speak clearly and honestly about this. This is a problem. Yes. And you are touching the, the... The soft spot. Of course. Yes. Thank you so much for helping me. So what do you think about this, what uh, Steve says? Because this is very important. Yeah. Um, I mean, two years is an ambitious one if we if we'd focused our efforts. I think if we really did, focus efforts on illegal fishing, I'd still, you'd still find it hard. You'd switch to cryptocurrencies or you'd... The, the problem is that these boats, they, they don't have their beepers on. They, it's, sometimes it's impossible to track. Then you have to use satellite imagery to try and detect lights on the sea to try and determine if it's a fishing vessel or not. Um, it's incredibly, incredibly difficult. Um, but we all do need to focus more on it. Um, we're, to bring it back to the first point you raised, like what is overfishing? It's a threshold, which I believe we passed a long time ago. So I don't even use the word overfishing anymore. I just use the word fishing. Um, there are areas in the world where people do depend on it, West Africa, certain areas of Indonesia, South America, some places that, that don't have any other option. But I think overall, I would like to see, I'm perhaps more optimistic that people can shift um, their, their diet choices around. And honestly, I, I believe that's, that's, that is the, the, there is a huge area of leverage there. There's a big lever that we can pull on that front. And I think if we simply, if just Europe alone slowly divested its subsidies, I don't know how many billion dollars there is uh, just coming from Europe, and slowly invested it into uh, alternative protein sources, people would switch without even noticing it. It's not even going to be like this big, we're going to save the world thing. It's just slowly, slowly, we'll just shift to different types of food, and it'll be great, and, and slowly we'll, we'll have a healthier sea. You, you want to say something? Steve, yeah, but only 20 percent. Uh, only 20 percent of all the uh, the estimate of illegal fishing of IU fishing is 20 to 30 percent of all fish caught in the ocean. Mm. So, 70 to 80 percent of all fish caught in the ocean is from legal fishing, exactly. right? Mm -hmm. From nations that, as you point out, subsidize their fishing with fuel. And many of those countries that subsidize their fishing for fuel, they also sub subsidize. The fuel is also provided to legal fishing vessels. 
They subsidize their fishing with research grants. The European Union buys the boats for fishermen, so they don't have to pay for their own boats. Um, they buy concessions in other countries so that they can fish there. I mean, without all those subsidies, that would change human behavior hu hugely, right? If they didn't subsidize fishing, none of us would eat that much fish because it would be too expensive. Hmm. It would be like eating a steak of a tiger or something because it's, it's, these are wild animals and it's incredibly expensive. Shabu shabu beef or something. Right. It would be like right. hand massaged fish. It would be so expensive you couldn't afford it. What do you think about this, Captain? Uh, let me just touch on it. Let me just touch on the topic that we haven't mentioned here, which is bycatch. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to give an example of one vessel that we caught about a year ago in Gabon. Uh, this was a vessel that has a license, uh, had a license to fish for shrimp. And we luckily had the uh, Gabonese Minister of Fishery on board at the time, and we did the inspection. But as soon as the nets came up from this fishing vessel, it turned out that 99.8% of their catch was bycatch. So 0.2% was actually shrimp. Now that means that the 99.8% is largely discarded dead back into the sea. So basically, for one shrimp cocktail, they were killing thousands and tens of thousands of animals. Now, unfortunately, this is happening on a large scale, and we don't really have an idea of how much the bycatch is, but if you look at that one vessel, the 99.8%, I'm sure the total number is lower, but still, we're talking about millions and millions of animals every single week that are being discarded as bycatch. And we as consumers have to realize that by buying that shrimp cocktail, uh, we were responsible for the death of those 10,000 animals. What do you think about this, the bycatch also, Anna? Yeah, I just wanted to add something. Is this working? Is it working? Yeah, okay. it is. So I just wanted to add something on, uh, to elaborate a bit on what Ali and Steve were saying. Uh, we, I think this is a no-brainer for most of us that work at least again in the European Union. Most of the NGOs do agree that public money should serve public good. And what's happening is that taxpayers, in this case euros, are uh, again subsidizing the fishing industry and that's a problem, a huge problem for us. We think that, okay, money is limited. Okay, we all get it, but if we are investing our money in this kind of activity, it should be in the activities that do not harm as much as the other activities do uh, in the ocean. So we absolutely do think there is a huge problem. I mean, some of these industries would not be profitable, again, uh, if they weren't subsidized. So if you have a business and it's not profitable um, on its own, What's happening? Why aren't we uh, uh, analyzing this problem? And why are we continuing to give money? And again, in Portugal, I mean, we have some cultural differences between the north of Europe and the south of Europe, but um, uh, it depends on where you are. And again, in Portugal, it's a bit difficult to talk about this because why? we have, I don't know, really. I think it's something that the socio, from a, point, uh, from, from a sociological point of view, I think it must be very interesting. It's not my area, so I'm not going to elaborate on that. But it's, it's true that we see on the field that it's very difficult to talk about this because we do feel that the people that work on the ocean, the fishers and everything, do have this sense of entitlement. They deserve, they, they, they deserve to catch the fish. It's their right, you know. And it's something that we, all, that, that we often discuss among ourselves. You know, fishing is not a human right. You know, you don't have the, the right to fish just because you exist. You should prove that you can fish. You should prove that your uh, techniques are as sustainable as they can be or that they do the least harm possible. So this is very complex, and, uh, and I'm not trying to make this uh, more, simple, more simple than it is, but absolutely we have a problem of overfunding and oversubsidizing some, some sectors of the fishing industry. And it's a waste of money, to be honest, and it should be applied in other uh, types of, um, of activities, for sure. So what, what do you all think that could, could facilitate the creation of a, a, an international body for conservation and monitoring the, the, the high sea? Because that's needed. What, what, what do you think the, the, the main step, the first step that can, can facilitate this? In the UK, um, their lobster, had, their lobster uh, collapsed. The lobster population collapsed. So in response to the collapse, they set up a lobster hatchery in the north of the UK where they um, hatch lobster eggs in the lab. They grow lobsters until they get to a certain point at which they're sustainable, and then they release them in the wild. And in the last four years, the lobster population has, re has been uh, rebuilt because they created this hatchery. 
So, like, how many people in the room are Portuguese? Okay, how many of you are willing to give up COD for five years? Well, that's a very good audience. This is not, that was about, yeah, this, that was about this 60%. This is not representative. Congratulations. <laughs> I look forward to auditing your COD purchases. Um, no, like, you know, this is not the fair representation. You know, in the 1990s, the COD population <laughs> collapsed because it was overfished, because of climate change, and it's still recovering. It could have recovered quicker if we had built hatcheries to respawn cod and rebuild the population. So, I, you know, I think it's just a shifting of financial resources from uh, subsidizing overfishing among nations that subsidize fishing to subsidizing fishing production. I think if you're in a fishing boat, you should be just as concerned about the population of the fish and you should be replenishing what you take, just like a farmer would. If you're a fishing fleet, you should be replenishing what you take. You put us thinking, and, and we are on our last three, four minutes, so uh, you gave us this, this strong message. Um, what message can, can you give and do you want to give to, to all the people that are with, with us here today? Because you are saying, okay, this, does, this is not representative because they are from CNN, you know? I, I know, but they are. Because before we are uh, deciders or we belong to some, some uh, um, sectors, we are human beings. So this is a, a, a personal choice. Yeah. So it's representative and, and I, I, I appreciate that and I thank you, thank you so much. So uh, what do you, you can say in, what can you say in one minute one to minute. the people that is hearing us? It, I, I know we are almost Portuguese, but this is a global meeting so we can get to everyone. Yeah, so I would say that first of all, if you have the chance and if it makes sense for your personal choices, try to eat less fish. Uh, I, I can see that a lot of us here are Portuguese, so you know how much fish you're eating, <laughs> and I know how much fish all of us are eating. So if you can, uh, try to, to eat it a bit less, of course. Um, again, I think it's very important that we educate our, ourselves and to understand where the products that we are consuming, again, not only about fishing, but still, uh, it's very important to understand where these products are coming from, how they are caught or how they are produced. So uh, I think it's very important to to be informed and to look for this information. Luckily, we live in a place where this information has to be displayed. If it's not displayed, you don't buy it. I think that's a fairly, uh, that's a fair thing to ask. And then, um, I mean, I work for an NGO and I absolutely, we absolutely believe in the power of uh, the, the people, you know? And I think it's very important that we associate ourselves with people that think more or less what we think. Again, it's important to know other people, but then if you, if you can merge your strength with other strengths and with other people that are motivated to do the same that you are, I think it can be very inspiring and I absolutely believe that all of us need a bit of inspiration during these days and, regard and with everything that's happening. So uh, if you can, look for uh, NGOs or associations that, you know, that think the same way you think and you'll feel inspired and you can inspire other people. So I would say that's, that's my, my take on this. Holly. I think um, I'll be repeating myself, um, but I think that it comes down to those three messages I said earlier, stop, defund, protect. So if we can put um, a, a focus on, on changing some personal things that we do every day, that's going to be great. Uh, but also seeing what political uh, power we have, uh, asking our politicians to put this at the focus um, of, of their decision making when it comes to the ocean. Um, and we also need to focus not only on the defunding aspect, but on protecting the ocean. Um, but generally, it just comes down to making more conscious and loving decisions every day. I think if we did that, I think we'd get a lot right in the long term. Steve. Steve. Yeah, I would like to see um, startup incubators and accelerators focusing on developing um, hatcheries for releasing wild caught fish with tagging so that when they're caught, some uh, revenue model can be generated. I'd like to see the Portuguese government step forward and subsidize hatcheries to replenish the fish that Portugal has taken out of the ocean for the last, what, 80, 90 years. Um, I'd like to see a private sector initiative to replenish the ocean 
with a profit model so that it's sustainable. And last but not least, Captain. Um, I invite everybody to uh, watch our videos or to even come on board our vessels and to see with your own eyes the, uh, the animal suffering that we see every single time we arrest the vessel. Not only the animal suffering, but also the living conditions of the fishermen that are being used to catch the fish that is being directed to the European market. I think it all comes down to us objectifying the ocean. You know, we talk about seafood, not sea life. We don't see it as life in the ocean. We see it as a source of food. We talk in metric tons, we talk about harvest, like it's corn. You know, the objectification of the ocean is what detaches ourselves as humans from the marine creatures. And I think it's really important. You know, we're living in harmony on this planet with other creatures. We have to realize that the marine species are being treated in a way that no land animals will be treated ever. And if we realize that, we'll definitely ad adapt our consumption of, uh, of marine protein. You know, thank you, thank you very much. I, I have a, a main sentence to, to finish this panel, but I, I'm not going to say it because I was hearing you and I was feeling, uh, and it has to be with my person, but also with my, my work uh, as a journalist of an environment. Uh, and one day, uh, uh, when I did a documentary about plastics in the ocean and pollution in the ocean, People said to me and asked me, "Oh, Katerina, was it was it? Did you need to, to show that shocking images of animals dying and showing an ocean that is so 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 far away from the the Disney uh, kids uh, um, that the kids see the Disney of the the the." the, the, the the, the, the small kids, can you help me? The small kids, they see, oh my God, the ocean is so beautiful and the animals they are all very happy. And then lots of people, lots of parents send me pictures and videos with kids watching the news and crying and saying, what is this? Why, 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 why are these animals being killed? Why, 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 what are we doing? Okay, so I think, yes, we need to show images we need to shock people to show them this is real this is happening uh, the dimension of the problem is here because i think if, if we don't talk about things but if we don't show things if we don't see things and if we don't feel like people things we don't do anything and, and that's my opinion so i want to thank you the four of you to, to, for your courage and for your honesty of speaking of this in this honest way uh, and for inspiring us all and, and I think that we are going getting out of the, of the room and we are going to think about this and think about what can I do in my home with my family, with my friends and then go and go and go acting locally to, to have global solutions. So thank you, thank you all, and, and please, next, we are going to have a debate about uh, ocean pollution, so stay with us. Thank you very much, thank you.